Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope all is well today, and it is a beautiful Sabbath day, isn't it? It truly is, it truly is. And uh, we're blessed to be able to come together as a family of God, whether you're here on site or online. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it is good to, this is a beautiful time of year, and it's good to just leave your house, and the sun is shining, and you're coming to the church, and it's just a beautiful experience. So I, w- I have a bunch of announcements. Uh, I want to run through them. First of all, for, for giving, if you give online, it's uh, thecollegechurch.com, and there's also some boxes in the back there with uh, tie envelopes if you want to if you want to go that method. We'll continue to tackle Rebirth 21, and uh, the goal is to eliminate Rebirth 21 in 21. So let's keep that in our stewardship planning. Um, so next week will be a little bit different. We are going to sing. <laughs> we are going to sing. Yep. All right. So we're going to sing. And, and we are, we're going to do it, though, because we want to be sensitive to the fact that we're all feeling different about this. So what we're going to do is we will have a normal service. There will be a postlude or a time of, of musical meditation, and if you want to, you may leave at that time because it will be at the very, very end of the service. Um, Also, the thinking is at this point, either one or both balconies will be no singing. Um, I think we'll put a sign to that effect, and we need to work on the details of that, but that's another place if you want to stay for the whole service but not be singing, we're, we're going to reserve either one side or both sides for a no singing area. So, this is going to be wonderful. It is, we're going to celebrate Easter. So it's a time we need to hear our voices together. And, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. So be prepared. But again, if you'd rather not, please come to the service. Remember, there'll be a time for just to quietly exit and, uh, or be seated in the balcony. Um, I want to mention that our online prayer meeting has been a true blessing and on Wednesday evenings, and we are having a wonderful, meaningful time on Friday evenings, too, on Zoom. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, it's just been very good to see the, 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 the connecting of the minds and the hearts as we're going through that powerful, powerful sermon. Uh, also, we received a nice thank you note here from North Star Ministry. And I'm going to read it. It's only like three sentences. Dear College Church volunteers, we just wanted to thank, take a minute and say thank you for your support. We are happy that you joined our volunteer team and are looking forward to a hopefully long-lasting friendship. Our families are grateful for each dinner you prepared for them. You made a difference in each of our families' lives. Thank you, North Star Family Services. So thank you for those who volunteered. And I believe our next time is that in June? Uh, Early June. Early June. June. So uh, if you want to get involved with that, talk with Steve Aubin, and uh, we'll get you put on our schedule. Um, Also, there is a, this is the final, final boarding call for the SNEC three-way plan that's going to need to go in next week. So if you have a child in school and want to take advantage of the three-way plan, let, let me know this week. Uh, before, actually, I'm sorry, before the end of March, which is next week. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight, and this may apply to one person here, for all I know, or, or, or nobody, but Southern New England Conference, as you know, we don't have a college anymore that's ours. And so the fear is, is that people will go to college to get their education, and from there we'll just sort of Uh, leapfrog or stepping stone to areas outside of our geographical area. So they have started a program called the Next Generation Teacher. And for junior and senior education majors, they can receive up to $4,000 per year for their tuition. The caveat would be the conference will, our conference will help support your education, whether you're at Andrews or Southern, with the anticipation that, and probably some sort of contractual agreement that you will consider or come back to SNEC to be one of our teachers. So I want to mention that to you, so there may be one person here today who is considering going into education and looking at all your options, so please keep that in mind. 
that uh, our conference is looking long term the fact that we will need teachers uh, for our schools over the coming years. Uh, I believe that covers us for announcements. Oh, next Sabbath, we are going to sh list the names of the people we have lost over the last year. Um, I'm going to read those through a part, as part of our service. And I'm saying that because if you would like to have a name remembered next week, please email the office, myself, let us know so that we can read those next Sabbath in remembrance and in anticipation of the second coming of our Lord. So please remember that. And uh, we have one more announcement for us as we continue our worship service. Good morning, church. I'm just up here to again, once again, uh, highlight women's ministry. Our meeting schedule will be this Tuesday at 7 p.m. And we're going to be um, starting our salad recipe exchange group. So if you have any favorite salads that you want to pass on, women's ministry at wercc.net. Um, we will be sharing those as you send them in for us. So we look forward to seeing you on the Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Thank you. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5. O oh Lord, you are my God. Early each day I will seek you. My soul longs to be in your presence. My whole being thirsts for you as if I were in a desert without water. I have felt your presence while in the sanctuary. I have seen your power and glory work on people's hearts and change them. To experience your loving kindness and care is better than anything life can offer. I will praise you as long as I live. I will raise my hands to you in prayer. Every day my soul feasts in your presence and my lips are eager to sing your praise. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in your sanctuary, for the privilege of being able to honor you and glorify your name with our feeble worship. May we open our hearts and our minds to receive what you yourself, Lord, have in store for us. We praise your name. Amen.
Hey, kids. Online kids. None of you are kids. <clears throat> or you're all kids. Is a baseball bat a good thing? Is a baseball a good thing? <laughs> that was safe, right? Baseball bat is a good thing when you use it to play baseball. And a baseball bat is a bad thing if I use it to hit somebody. Right? Good things can be used in bad ways. <clears throat> Water. Good thing? Yeah, good thing. <clears throat> Handkerchief. Good thing? Yeah? But if I take my handkerchief and I put it over somebody's face and I pour water on it, I can be torturing somebody with a good thing and a good thing. Good things can be used to do bad things. <clears throat> ah, but there's an exception. Good thing or bad thing? A good thing, the Bible. Can the Bible be used to do bad things? Every good thing that God gives us can be used to do bad things. A very famous atheist by the name of Richard Dawkins recommends that Bible be taught as part of every education. He believes that nobody's education is complete without a thorough grounding in the Bible. The Bible is used to drive more people away from Christianity then it is used to drive people into Christianity. Good thing or bad thing? Even Satan quoted the Bible to Jesus in the desert when he was trying to tempt Jesus. Sadly, even the Bible like the baseball bat, like the water, like the handkerchief, can be used to do bad things. Part of getting older is learning wisdom, learning how to use good things to do good things 
and recognizing when good things are used to do bad things. This is a very special book. Let's use it to do good things. Heavenly Father, you give us so many good things. And we misuse them. And yet you still love us, even when we take the best things that you give us and misuse them. You love us. You still reach out to us. You forgive us. You seek us. Let us learn from that. And when people use good things to do bad things to us, let us learn to forgive them and love them just as you love us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, no food today. Tomorrow, March 28th, will mark one year since we started live streaming our service, if you care to recall that with us. Some time long ago, the college church started filming our services, single camera, onto a VHS tape, and after the service, Ron Harris, who would film them, would run them down to the local access channel, give it to them, and then at some appointed time, you could watch the service. And over time, it became more than one camera, and then eventually we got to where we would have it put on YouTube, and we kept making advancements, and then all of a sudden, March 28th came along and we did our first live stream. And I'm here to tell you, for the 10 of us, I think there were 10 of us in the building, it was a bizarre experience. You may not think so, because I've been in sanctuaries by myself before, working on something, but to be here for a church service with 10 people in the building was really strange. And I'm going to give you a just quick feel of what it was like. We used to have, right here on the front row, a single camera. Back there were Dennis's currently with the stand-up camera. We had that one, we still have the one back there and the one over there, but what we had done is one of the cameras was put right here and one was right there and there were cables running here and there and we walked in and we were trying to figure out where are we supposed to go and how are we supposed to operate and eventually if you go back and watch one of the services and I went back and watched the first one, you might catch a part where we decided we'd start panning the sanctuary just to show everybody that there was nobody here. So if anybody was watching and saying, oh, they're gathering, we could show them, no, it's empty. You'd see a person and a person because what would happen after you got done with your part, you'd walk back to about right here and you could relax because you were out of the camera's range. And it was, re I called it the largest indoor studio in central Massachusetts because you looked around and there's nobody. And we got to where we would hold up hands, this camera's the live one, so we would know where to look. And eventually we started to progress and get better at it and better at it to where one year later, we're getting pretty good at it. I went down there this morning during Sabbath school to see how they run it because you'll notice there are small cameras, including one mounted on the wall over there, that are run from downstairs with a joystick. So someone downstairs is operating them. So I sat down and tried to operate it, and it became very clear that I never played video games in my life because I had no idea what I was doing. And Donnie and his patience was explaining things to me, and it was in a foreign language. And after this is done, I'm going to go back down there because they're short today. But I ask that as they should be at home, you should be able to see it now on your screen. They're going to put up a couple of email addresses. But for the rest of you, it's in your bulletin. I encourage you, on those email addresses, send a thank you note. Send a thank you note to the people you never see, the people that are invisible. If you ever watch any award shows or occasionally during a live sporting broadcast, they'll do a quick shot of inside the control center. And there's monitors and buttons and people are moving here and there and they're talking, again, in a language we don't understand. 
and then briefly they're back and you forget how much goes into that. And those are highly paid professionals and we have volunteers downstairs right now making sure that you can watch this at home. Please send them a thank you note and let them know that you appreciate it. And you'll also notice there's one on there that has never been down there to run those cameras. And send a thank you note to our pastor. This is 15 months he's been here. 15 normal, calm, regular months to the point where he'll still walk over and he'll say, um, who is this? And that's because most of you he's never seen without a mask. And there's a lot of you he's never seen. We have a database that you can look at all the names and who's that? And it can be someone who's been here for decades, literal decades. And the first time he's going to meet them, they're going to have a mask on. Send him a thank you note because it hasn't been an easy 15 months, but he's done a wonderful job. Can I get an amen? We look forward to having everybody back real soon. For those who need the vaccine, that they have it, and eventually maybe we can toss these masks aside, and the pastor and all the rest of us can remember that there are human faces underneath there. If you have any additional praises or concerns, I invite you to bring them to your minds now, and I invite those of you who are willing and able to kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, what a gorgeous Sabbath day you've given us. And what a wonderful opportunity we have always known to worship you and together. Or at least we did until last March when it was temporarily taken away from us. And we are grateful. With absolute gratitude, we thank those who have tirelessly worked to make sure that even virtually, we could continue to meet. Who could have seen that at some point church doors across this land and world would be closed and the only way to worship together would be to stare at a screen? And yet, you who sees everything and knows the beginning from the end knows what happens, what will happen, and you hopefully, Lord, will be patient with us as we try to use it for good. We're grateful for the grace you have shown to us because there have been many times where we have had technical issues and yet they have been small. We've largely been able to do this without much difficulty and technical issues and we're grateful. We give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for those who have been able to get the vaccinations. And as they slowly start to be able to return to a sense of normality, we pray that you'll be with them because it's not going to be easy. When you're away from something for a while, it's hard to get used to getting back into it. We pray for our world as we try to find our, our legs, our sea legs, if you will, as we try to figure out how we're going to integrate back into what life is. I mean, we're just going to finally get a chance to start singing in church would have saw that. Lord, you have the answers. As Ralph showed us, you gave it to us in your book, and help us to use that book for good. First, by studying it. Second, by praying for understanding. And third, by being willing to share to people the love that you have planted in there and sown in our hearts. Be with us as a church, as a nation, as a world. May you reign in the hearts of each and every one, is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is found in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Hello. <laughs> I'm used to the mic being on a, this side. <laughs> um, love Light is one of the easiest songs I've ever written because I feel like I didn't write it. It was written, I think it was back in 2016. I was sitting in nap time in our kindergarten classroom, feeling a little frustrated because I was working on trying to put a set list together for praise and worship. It was February, it was supposed to be about loving people, and I was trying to come up with a you know, upbeat opening song about loving people and caring about people, and I was coming up empty. So I thought, hmm, God, what would I want to say in a song about loving others? And it just came right up, and I wrote it all down, melody, everything. Like, I don't know, 20 minutes, got home, it's like, hey, honey, I need you to sit down for a minute with your guitar and help me out here. And that's how Love Light was brought into being. <laughs> so I think one of the happiest moments of singing Love Light is actually not going to happen today because I do it in the classroom all the time and watching the little kids sing it and do all the motions that we've come up with it is like the best thing ever. So I'm hoping someday after we and congregate in bigger numbers. We can bring them up front and you can see their happy, shiny faces and how enthusiastic they get when they sing it. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Just come and be a love light in our hearts that shines through to everyone else we come in contact with.
Thank you for that prayer. And uh, I think it ought to be noted that I believe this church building is about 40 years old. I'm thinking it was 1981. And I think this was probably the first time that a baseball bat had been swung in this sanctuary. <laughs> and, uh, but at any rate, it's, it's been a real blessing these last 15 months. And, uh, you know, I wanted to add what, to what Cameron mentioned is that we have a very generous church, and uh, last year was a testimony of the fact that we did the roof project and didn't need the loan, but more importantly, the funding for the live stream ministry just sort of evolved and just popped up because we saw there was a need, and I'm so thankful for that. That's, for me, it was just a blessing that we were able to get, and, and Donnie and the whole team really put this together and we have, we're really blessed in many different ways. So it was really awesome how that came to be. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the song we just heard. And at the end of the day, that's what we want, to think like you, to, to act like you, to interact with people like you. And Lord, we pray that as we look at this familiar story, that you will draw to our minds and to our hearts the things that we need to learn as we navigate through a rather confusing time of history. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, make no mistake, this book right here is filled with bad decisions. Bad decisions some good decisions and some great decisions. The greatest, of course, is when God said, let us make man in our own image. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it's filled with some really bad decisions. One website listed 25 different bad decisions. And so my wife and I came up with some possible uh, expressions that people may have made who made these decisions. And I'm going to ask for us to... to uh, Guess what these are. All right? So here's the first one. This is what somebody could have said. Oh, I'll give this fruit a try. <laughs> Self-explanatory. How about, let me have some too. <laughs> How about this one? Location, location, location. Look at the city view this house comes with. Who's that? Lot, exactly. How about this one? Since Uriah is away on a business trip, I'll check on his house from the rooftop of my house. That was a bad decision, wasn't it? How about this one? You and my sister look so much alike anyway, who cares if I call you that? Oh, yeah. And, of course, here's another one. Oh, I can convert her. Oh, I can convert her. It could be maybe a couple people, but I'm, we're thinking about Samson and Delilah. I can convert her. Lastly, we can make a better God. We can make a better God. And this is, I believe, we believe, could have been spoken by Aaron. As Moses is on the mountain, he's taking too long, and I love his excuse. We threw in this gold and out popped this golden calf. How did that happen? How did that happen? But let's face it, bad decisions are part of life. It's in the Bible. It's in our own lives. It's everywhere. And how can we avoid making bad decisions? Or let's put it this, how can we make bad decisions? How can we make the bad decisions? Because today's focus or today's story comes to us from a man who has been called elitist, xenophobic, he's stubborn, he's a hypocrite, he's narrow-minded, he's selfish, and he also happens to be the best evangelist of all times. He is the best evangelist of all times. As a matter of fact, he has the, the evangelism Midas touch so much so that he converted people 
to his God when he's trying to run away from his God. He's got the touch. He is considered a minor prophet, or whether we might call him the recalcitrant prophet. His book has only 47 verses in it. His name, of course, is Jonah. It means dove. And we can learn so much from his experience about how to make a bad decision. Let's turn with me, turn with me in that book of Jonah. It's seven books backwards from the book of Malachi, if you're in a Bible, paper Bible. And, and uh, it comes to us around the 700, 750, 800 B.C. time frame. And, and Jonah is, how shall we say, probably minding his own business. And it says there in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. In 2002, the publishing industry was struck shocked by a book that came on the scene. In 2002, it was by a pastor, and it stood on the bestseller list for years to come. It actually sold 32 million copies. It's been translated into 85 different languages, and the book, of course, is called Purpose Driven Life. The author, Rick Warren, has obviously done pretty well with this to the point that he practices what he calls reverse tithing. He actually lives off of 10% and gives away 90% of the, of the book's sales. Now I'm saying all this is because 32 million copies, 32 million copies of a book called Purpose Driven Life. People want to know why am I here? People want to know, does God have a purpose for my life? Does God have an agenda? Does God have some sort of direction? And it's a, it's a book well worth reading. And in it, he says, it is impossible, it is impossible to do everything people want you to do. But you have just enough time to do God's will. And I think he's right about that. We are not set here to do what other people want us to do. We are set here to do what God wants us to do. And Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, reminds of that fact. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes he doesn't speak to us directly. He doesn't reveal his will to us in a fortune cookie where we pop it open. Oh, I know, I'm supposed to go to Nineveh. He doesn't skywrite it. He doesn't reveal it to us. But it comes to us in many different ways, and C.S. Lewis puts it like this, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become because he made us. Now that's important to remember because inside your DNA, inside your psyche, inside your mind, inside your heart, God has some clues about what you're supposed to do with your life. God has put there a mission and a, and a plan for your life. In this case, Jonah gets it revealed to him in this way. But so often we have to discern it. We have to kind of figure it out as we go along. There's a story that is told about a woman who went to a, 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 a wise man in, in the rabbinic tradition. And he says these, she says these words. She's married and she says, My husband and I have been married for several years and we have an empty home. We still have an empty home. They wanted a child. The wise man said, you know, my mother had the same problem. And she visited the holy Bishet, the founder of the Hasidic movement, asking him for his, his blessing. She brought him a coat that she had sewn with her own hands over many weeks. And when she gave it to him, he blessed her with a child. And I, the man telling the story, was born a year later. The woman says, thank you, teacher. I will go home right away and begin sewing a coat for you. It will be beautiful. I will use the best wool and the finest colors. I will return as soon as possible. And the wise man said, my dear, you do not understand. You see, my mother did not know this story. And the fact of the matter is, 
We don't know how it's going to turn out. There's no formula for, for, formula for discerning God's will. There's no way. Elie Wiesel put it like this, we must step off the page into our own situation, which is unmapped and unknown. That's how it is. And so the best thing we can do is to try to figure out how to <clears throat> make bad decisions. What is the deal? What's the process? What thought process did Jonah go through as he tried to figure out running away from God? And I tell you, as, as I read the story more and more, I'm so intrigued because it, it, with it because my friends, Jonah was so human. He's so much like us. He's so much like us. But every so often, God performs a miracle. And i got to tell you a story I came across about a 15-year-old young man. His name is Connor. And as his day was tradition, he would come home from school, and there would be a stack of magazines, the new ones that just came in the mail. And he would usually grab one magazine and go up to his bedroom and read for a while. And he admitted, just used to flip through looking for funny stuff, comics or whatever it was. But this one day, there was only one magazine on the kitchen counter. It happened to be from an organization called World Vision dealing with world hunger. He didn't know that. He'd take the magazine, went up to his bedroom, began leaping through it. Ten minutes goes by. Twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty. He was sitting at the edge of his bed for a whole hour, just mesmerized by this magazine as he was looking at all these pictures of hungry kids in another continent then called Africa. He was dumbfounded. He was shocked. He did not know that this other world existed where 1.1 billion people don't have access to clean water. And he was troubled by this. And he said in his mind, here's this 15-year-old kid, this isn't right. And he felt as if God was saying, look how blessed you are, Connor. Just look around at how much I've blessed you with. Now what are you going to do about it? Well, Connor couldn't stop thinking about that special magazine that he, had, he was reading. Every time he drank a glass of water, clean water, he thought about those people in, in another continent who had to walk miles for basically swamp water. Finally, he had an idea. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make bracelets, and I'm going to sell them for money so that we can dig wells in, in Africa. Well, where do you start? He started with his friends. And he formed a team of a group of people who could change, knew they could change the world, and they were all young. There was one 17-year-old, one 16-year-old, and two 15-year-olds who were on his team. And they got together, they pooled their ideas, their resources, and they made these bracelets. So he was selling them. They sold 3,500 of them. They began into tea, selling T-shirts, water bottles, and they raised $20,000, which allowed them to build four wells in Africa and an irrigation system in Africa. Now think about that for one moment. Do you think possibly God set it up so that that day he would come home and there was one magazine on the kitchen counter that he happened to grab and he opened it up and then suddenly God begins working. And sometimes that's how God works right in front of us. And the issue is, if we want to make a, ba a bad decision, we must begin with this number one step. Forget God's heart. If you want to make a bad decision, forget about God's heart. Step number two is related to that. Forget about your own heart. Forget about your own heart. Verse three, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. It has been said that many people should be given an Olympic medal in the long jump because they're so good at jumping to conclusions. <laughs> Some people should be given a gold medal in track because they're so good at running from their problems. And the fact of the matter is we do it and Jonah did it. And the simple thing, if you ever want to take some time on this, look at this, Tarshish is about 550 miles away from him. Do you know how, I'm sorry, Nineveh is 550, 550 miles away from him. Tarshish is 2,500 miles. So to not deal with his problem is going to cost him five times the amount of travel it would to deal with his problems. 
Does that ever sound like something we as human beings do? The energy, the mental, emotional energy we spend in avoiding dealing with a problem and not being true to our own hearts is tantamount to Jonah going to Tarshish instead of just spending a fifth of the mileage and going over to Nineveh. Now what's interesting about his response is what he doesn't do. You see, Jonah doesn't talk back to God. He doesn't respond. Now Jonah could easily have learned from the playbook of Moses and Abraham because they both do that. They both dialogue with God. They both say, God, I can't do this. You know, and, and they have this honest conversation. And that's the thing that Jonah does not do. He runs from the problem. Instead of saying, God, having a conversation, you know what, this is crazy idea of you. The Ninevites, these guys are a pain in the neck, they're evil, and prophetically speaking, in the future, they're going to invade us. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Instead, he takes this situation and he puts it in a box. He leaves it there. He says, I'm not going to deal with this problem. I'm getting on a boat. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. And instead of going to Nineveh, I'm going to Tarsus. Now, I'm saying all this because he may have been smart in his mind, but I don't know if he had smart in his emotional approach. Now, we've all heard about this thing called IQ. What's your intelligence quotient? Have you heard about EQ? Your emotional, your, your emotional quotient. Now, to, for a definition here, here's what I came across by Gloria Cabellos. She defines EQ as the ability to perceive, use, and understand and manage emotions. To be, to be emotionally in, intelligent is to be smart about feelings, to have the ability to blend our thinking and our feelings to make wise decisions and to foster meaningful relationships. A key component of EQ is self-awareness. Jonah isn't very self-aware. He's trying to, he knows what God wants him to do. He says, no, thank you, and he's going to run away from it, and it, in sense, essentially he's running away from himself. So here's what they suggest on, be, on raising our EQ level. Number one, ask God to open your mind and make you aware through the Holy Spirit of what you need to understand about yourself. Ask God to open your mind to make you aware through the Holy Spirit of what you need to understand about yourself. Secondly, ask yourself if you can identify your feelings. Ask yourself if you can identify your feelings. Thirdly, ask if you understand how to deal with your feelings. And this is where poor Jonah got stuck. He couldn't deal with it. So what does he do? He runs away. Just like we as human beings so often run away, run away from our problems. And that's why I like the story of Jonah. He is a human being. He's so real. And he runs away. But the thing, the fact of the matter is, is we can't run away from God, nor can we run from, away from situations we don't necessarily like. And fourthly, she says, feelings create a path to knowledge about yourself and other. Dan Bray is a chaplain in the, in, in, in the army, lieutenant commander, and he puts it like this, emotional intelligence can be seen in the following five areas of our lives, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. When we are aware of what makes us us, we become more conscious <clears throat> of our own feelings and motives. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, my friends, Jonah got stuck on the fourth verse, fourth word that God said. See, God said, Arise, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. The problem is, Jonah's beginning to see a God he didn't know existed. And he's beginning to realize that God is more generous, more kind, more graceful, more loving towards other people than he wants God to be. And you see, Jonah, Jonah was living in the darkest before he found himself in the darkness of the, of the whale's stomach. 
Jonah found himself with acidic thinking before he found himself smothered in the stomach acid of the whale. You see, Jonah was closed-minded before he found himself limited, with limited options, before he found himself encapsulated in the guts of the fish. The story begins before it begins. It's all about Jonah, and maybe Jonah has already been in the fish. And the story is simply a a revelation of what's gone on in his life this whole time. Some of us, my friends, are living, breathing inside the dark, acidic stomach, claustrophobic stomach of a fish's stomach. Because we don't want to deal with some issues. We don't want to face them. And so, how to make a bad decision comes back to three things. Number one, forget about God's heart. Number two, forget about our own heart. And thirdly, to forget about the hearts of others. To forget about the hearts of others. One of the preachers of the 20th century that we are truly indebted to and inspired a lot of us is a guy named Billy Graham. Years ago, I went to one of his series, and there was a special school training series for pastors, and I was probably in my early 20s, and I went. It was in Buffalo, New York, and I remember that night when when he was going to address the pastors. There was like a thousand of us there, and he walked in there, and, and I remember the electricity that was there in the room, and it was just amazing to see this amazing person who had used his gifts and abilities to such a wonderful degree. And he's left a wonderful impact on, this, on, on, on society. But in his autobiography, he has one regret. He, said this, he, he tells us in his, in, his, uh, in his autobiography, Just As I Am, and he said it be, it's sort of a two-stage regret, beginning with innocence and then ending up with heartbreak. It was at the end of uh, an event, and, and he was with John F. Kennedy. And, and they would start talking, and, 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 and Kennedy asks uh, uh, Graham, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus? And Franklin Graham said, I certainly do. And JFK says, what does my church believe? And, Kennedy, and Kennedy, uh, uh, Graham says, well, they have their creed. And, and, Kennedy, and Kennedy says, well, they don't preach it. They don't tell us much about it. I'd like to know what you think. And so right there on the spot, Uh, Franklin Graham says, I explained what the Bible says about Christ coming the first time, dying on the cross, raising from the dead, and then promising he would come back. Only then will we have permanent peace. So Kennedy says, very interesting. We'll have to talk more about that later. And then they separate. He drove on. Several years later, they meet again at the 1963 National Prayer Breakfast. Billy Graham remembers, I had the flu, and after I gave my short talk, I, he gave his, we walked out of the hotel together, hotel together to the car. It was his custom. They're at the curb, and JFK turns to Billy Graham and says, Billy, could you ride back to the White House with me? I'd like to talk with you for a minute. Now, Billy Graham had the flu, and he said, Mr. President, I've got the flu. Not only am I weak, but I don't want to give you this thing. Couldn't we talk some other time? It was a cold, snowy day. He said it was freezing. He didn't have his overcoat. And Kennedy graciously said, of course. Well, as Billy Graham recounts, later that year, Kennedy was shot. And he says his hesitation at the car door, his request haunts me still. What was on his mind? Should I have gone with him? It was an irrecoverable moment. Well, I'm going to tell you, my friends, fortunately, God is bigger than our mistakes. And fortunately, Billy Graham didn't just throw up his hands while I quit because it was 1963. And we have a lot to learn from that. But the fact of the matter is, is what if Billy Graham had said, yes, I'll go with you to the White House and let's have a conversation. We don't know what would have happened. What if Jonah had said, yes, I'm going to go right away? What would have happened? How would the story have navigated itself? 
And so often the key question is, can I say yes? Now I've got to ask you a question. What is the number one search engine in the world right now? <clears throat> What's it called? Google. <clears throat> exactly. That was a throwaway question. <laughs> Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt was for many years the CEO of Google. And he says these words, find a way to say yes to things. Say yes to invitations to a new country. Say yes to meeting new friends. Say yes to learning something new. This is how you get your first job, your, your, your first job, your next job, your spouse, and even your kids. Now I'm saying all this because what if Google said, you know, we're a search engine, we don't need maps. What if Google said, we're a search engine, we don't need docs. What if Google said, we're a search engine, we don't need photos. We're a search engine, we don't need a translator. We're a search engine, we don't need a, a, a spreadsheet. The key is they learned to say Y-E-S. Y -E -S. And the question is sometimes is <clears throat> when posed with an opportunity, do we or do we not say yes? We know how the story wraps up. Because eventually Jonah is forced, and thankfully God in his mercy forces Jonah to deal with this. And he puts him in a corner, and he says, Jonah, I know I want you to do this. And I must tell you, my friends, I am glad that we serve a stubborn God like that. I am glad we do. Because so often we limit God by defining the boundaries. But when he's able to give, have full reign of our lives, who knows where he will take us, even if it is to Nineveh? Well, the story continues on, and God eventually says yes, and Jonah becomes the most effective evangelist ever. I'm serious. You look at it. The whole city gets converted. No other evangelist can say that. Billy Graham can say that. Nobody can say that. It just doesn't happen. And as I mentioned, he converts the guys who throw him overboard. All of these things happen. Finally, we see Jonah's acting up. Finally, Jonah, Jonah is responding the right way. And he's saying, okay, God, I will do what you ask me to do. Lori Beth Jones has an interesting ministry about coaching people on how to improve themselves, how to grow, how to develop. And she says these words, in this laboratory that is my life, I have seen priests transformed into ski instructors, CEOs turned into youth pastors, youth pastors become CEOs, I've seen housewives become artists, prisoners become bread makers, students become preachers, nurses become mothers, lawyers become winemakers, CPAs turn into distributors of cookies at daycare centers and loving it. It is one thing to ask God for what you want, real change happens when you ask what God wants for you. And so that comes back to the heart of the matter. But if you want to make a bad decision, forget about God's heart, forget about your own heart, and forget about the hearts of others. Do we have the ability to say yes? Of course we do. Of course we do. Do we have the opportunity of choice? We do. Do we have the opportunity to see some amazing things happen that ordinarily would not have happened if we said, yes, Lord, I am willing to go to Nineveh? My friends, making a bad decision is spoiled down to simply forgetting about God's heart, forgetting about our own heart, and forgetting about the hearts of others. God, you are my healer. Bye.
child in heaven. Help us remember that as we make those decisions in life, to ask three simple questions. How will this affect your heart? Secondly, how is it in our heart? And to deal with that, Lord, whether there's trouble or there's peace. And Lord, thirdly, how does this affect the hearts of others? Lord, we want to pray that as we go through this world, through this thing called life, I pray, Lord, that we will be attentive to all these three areas. That we realize that we are here for your honor, for your glory, for your grace. We are an instrument in your hands, Lord. We pray that we will keep that in mind as we move forward day by day, Lord, and are faced with decisions large and small. And may everything that we do and say and think be done to your glory. In Jesus' saving name we pray, amen.